We now continue with explaining the difficult scriptures in the New Testament. So we have, of course, several of those in uh, Paul's epistles, the first one and the second one to Corinthians. So here is the first one in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. In the passage that will be verse 1 through 3 is one of those difficult scriptures. It says, There any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Know you not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Now many have questions about exercising one's legal rights. Although the Bible mentions court action, it does so mostly in a negative light. You see, Paul actually in this passage, uh, starting in verse 1, uh, that's uh, chapter 6, verse 1 through verse 6, Paul actually rebuked the Corinthians for going to court to settle differences between brethren. Now disputes involving those who are not members of the Church of God, of course, must be settled elsewhere in the world that is usually in a court of law. Romans chapter 13 shows that God has allowed the government of this world to maintain law and order and to punish crime. Matters involving the laws of this world, therefore, can be settled in the world's courts. It is not wrong to use the protection of the law. Even so, Jesus gave us some words of wisdom concerning lawsuits. For example, if we have wronged someone or have caused someone to be injured, we are advised to settle the issue fairly before we get dragged into court and a judgment is rendered against us. That uh, advice is of Jesus found in Matthew 5, verse 25 and 26. Now, obviously, we cannot settle a matter and a suit results. We must defend ourselves. If we cannot settle a matter and a suit results, then we must defend ourselves legally. If the final judgment is against us, we are counseled not to pay the penalty, but to do so in a non-begrudging manner. That advice is found in Matthew 5 and verse 40. We must not have a hard-bitten, quarrelsome attitude of resistance and gripping or griping as is common in this world. Rather, we are commanded to guide our lives by the law of love. Now, most of the time, a person who applies the teaching of the Bible will be able to settle any differences without going to court. God looks on our hearts and is concerned with the attitude we have in these matters, whether of love toward others or of selfishness and concern only for ourselves. You see, God also offers wisdom and guidance to those who seek Him and obey His commandments. He offers wisdom and guidance, as we are told in Psalms 111, verse 10, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, and in James chapter 1, verses 5 through 7. Now certainly, one ought to pray wholeheartedly for God's help in resolving difficulties peaceably. God is able to make even our enemies to be at peace with us if our ways please Him. We read about that in Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 7. Another difficult scripture is found in the same chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and in verse 19. It says, What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? Now many have a question concerning donating one's body for medical research after death. Well, you see, the Bible is silent regarding this topic. There is no scriptural proof one way or the other. Therefore, as with other issues, whether or not to donate one's body organs for scientific research must be a personal decision based on the individual's conscience and understanding. Now, we need to keep in mind that medical science does not have the best reputation for how organs and tissues were obtained for study and how they were used. Through the centuries, the scientific community has had to battle much superstition and false belief. Nevertheless, if a person wishes to contribute to the betterment of mankind in any way or in this way in particular, that would be his or her own decision. So again, if you want to be, you know, contribute to the betterment of humankind in this way, that is your own decision. However, even though donating one's body for furthering medical research is a personal decision that violates no biblical laws, Many people, rightly so, find this practice to be abhorrent. Not only should one not violate his own conscience, but the feelings and conscience of family members should be also taken into consideration. So the practice of love would compel us to avoid offense when we can. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, is 
another, that's another difficult scripture, which says, Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will not eat no flesh while the world stands, lest I make my brother to offend. Now, this scripture you might remember when we analyze the uh, difficult scriptures in Romans. This scripture is indeed uh, a parallel one to the uh, to the passage we read and analyzed in Romans chapter 14. You see, this verse, in the, this verse indeed is quoted to prove that Paul did not eat meat and was a vegetarian. That's used by some people today in today's world. Well, you know, that's certainly not the case because as shown in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 4, Paul was talking about those meats offered in sacrifice unto idols. Also, Paul showed that followers of Christ, they know an idol is nothing and that there is only one God. He mentions that again in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 4. But some of the brethren who were new and weak uh, ate the meat. They still thinking that the God was the God, I mean with the lowercase g. So some who were weak and new, they ate the meat still thinking that God was in the meat or that it had special significance since it had been offered to the idol. And because of this, their conscience was being defiled. So therefore, in this same chapter, chapter 8 and verse 10, verse 10 shows some may have been eating, you know, meant in the temple, or eating meat that is in the temple, or were close to doing so, you know. Uh, they would not, of course, worship, worship uh, in that temple. So they would not worship there, but they could get a cheap meal there, something like a church supper, you know. So this led the others who were weak to feel bold to go also in the temple and to eat meat. But they still ate the meat with the consciousness that it had been offered to an idol. So that was, you know, the issue really, nothing else. And this was causing the weak brother to perish, as it says in verse 11. So Paul condemned the whole idea of going into the temple to eat meat as sin against the brethren and Christ in verse 12. Later, in the same letter, that will be in chapter 10, verses 19 through 23, Paul shows that though the idol is nothing, there is a demon spirit behind it, and that spirit permeates the idol's temple or false church as well. Therefore, Paul said they should never fellowship with demons, which they would be doing by eating meat in the temple. Also, in the same chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 21, Paul told them they cannot be partakers of God's table and the table of demons. Acts chapter 15 verse 29 shows a command from James to all the church to abstain from meat offered to idols. Now, Paul condemned the idea of eating meat in the temple and their flaunting of their knowledge and liberty before those who were weak and didn't yet understand, not the eating of meat per se, you see. So he was not a vegetarian. He was not advocating vegetarian lifestyle. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 13, Paul is saying that if eating meat would make my brother to offend as their eating meat in the temple would cause their brother to sin, then he wouldn't eat the meat. In fact, the fact that, in the fact is that Paul did eat meat because he condemned vegetarianism as a doctrine of demons. Oh yes, it's in the Bible. Many people seem not to realize that. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, Paul condemns vegetarianism. And that, of course, doesn't mean that one's choice to live without meat would be wrong, since the health benefits of vegetarian lifestyle are well known to all of us. However, it is a matter of personal choice, not a biblical commandment. And if it's not the biblical commandment, that means it's not the will of God. The will of God is that he has given us free choice. If somebody makes a free choice, personal choice, not to eat meat, that's great. But if somebody uh, wants to make or force others to do it based on a biblical command, there is no biblical command about that. First Corinthians chapter 10 in verse 27, that's another difficult scripture. It says, If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and you be disposed to go, whatsoever is said before you eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Now, of course, this is many people think, and some say that this verse means that if you are invited to dinner and are served unclean meats, such as pork, you should eat it without question to avoid offending your host. Well, again, 
keep in mind that in that culture back then it was very common to sacrifice meat to idols before they were go to the marketplace. So did God here make an exception to his law? Are there circumstances under which it is all right, even advisable, to eat unclean meats? Well, again, the context has nothing to do with clean or unclean meats, but with meat offered to idols. Take a look at this, it's chapter 10 in First Corinthians, look at verse 19 and verse 28. So the context is the meat offered to idols. If one wants to take this verse out of context, then if your host puts a sea in it, razor blades or a bowl of acid in front of you, well, you should eat it, lest you offend him. This, of course, is ridiculous. The Corinthians, converted from pagan idolatry, came from a society in which sacrificing to various idols was a daily way of life. Those offerings were sacrificed in the pagan, those offerings, I mean, meat offerings, of course, were sacrificed in the pagan temples continually, and the meat was usually eaten by the person who brought it. Now, often, however, not all the meat was consumed. And each day the priests were left with a surplus, not willing to miss a chance to turn a quick profit. They sold extra the extra meat to local butcher shops called shambles, where it was sold to the public. And this is where the problem arose, you see. Paul had taught the converts at Corinth not to become involved in pagan rituals or sacrifices. You have the teaching of Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in the passage from verse 14 through the verse 21. So the followers of Christ should have no connection with such idolatrous practices. But some question eating the leftover sacrificial meat sold in the butcher shops. How are the followers of Christ to tell the difference between ordinary meat and that which came from pagan altars? And if you were invited to a friend's home, how could you be sure the host wasn't serving so-called defiled meat. So therefore Paul explained that the idol was just wood and stone in verse 19 of chapter 10. The meat offered to it was just meat. The sin would be in actually participating in pagan ceremony. Paul explains in verse 20 and 21 of chapter 10. And therefore Paul told the Corinthians to stop worrying and to go ahead and buy their meat from the meat markets without asking whether it had been sacrificed to idols. That's in verse 25. It didn't matter where the meat came from as long as it was good meat. And the same principle applied to eating at the home of a friend. It did not matter whether where the meat came from or what had happened to it. Meat was meat regardless. As long as it was clean meat, it was all right to eat. That's why Paul said, If any of those who do not believe invites you to dinner and you desire to go, eat whatever is set before you. That's verse 27, and this what I've just read, this New King James Version. Now when Paul wrote whatever, he was referring to any clean meat which either had or had not been offered in sacrifice to an idol. Paul's statements have nothing to do with the question of clean versus unclean meat. He was not claiming God's dietary laws were done away. He was simply showing that it was all right to eat clean meat, which had once been part of a sacrifice to an idol. Now, you usually would not have to ask whether or not what you are eating is pork. You can usually discern that. The true meaning is that if the followers of Christ to whom Paul was writing, went to an unconverted person's house for a meal. They didn't have to ask him if the meat he served them had been offered to an idol. Idols are nothing to true Christians, and whatever or not, or, or, and whether or not the meat had been offered to an idol is of no importance. Now, Paul also did add one warning. He said in verse 27, he said to ask no question for conscience sake. In other words, don't ask the host where the meat came from. It is better to ignore the matter since it makes no difference anyway. If the follower of Christ questioned the host about the meat and then ate it, the host might be led to think that his Christian guest was compromising his belief. Others present might be left with the impression that idol worship is not so bad in the eye of a true Christian. Now, if someone 
if someone volunteers the information that the meat is tainted, then in consideration of that person's conscience, the follower of Christ should refrain from eating it. However, if the host or someone else brought up the subject and told the followers of Christ that the meat was offered in sacrifice to an idol, and did so in a way that led the hearers to believe the speaker thought the hearers should not eat it, well, they should refuse, not because it harmed them, but because of the conscience of the other person. Now, this might cause the other person to think that idol worship was all right, or cause him to think that, you know, they were hypocrites for claiming to be the followers of Christ and appearing to worship the idol by eating meat sacrificed to it. Paul mentions this in chapter 10, verse 28 of First Corinthians. Now, again, the context, you know, is important. The context of this chapter concerns whether or not it is permissible for a follower of Christ to eat meat that had been offered to idols. The whole topic of discussion is whether or not to eat meats previously offered to idols, not clean and unclean meats. Clean and unclean meats are not the topics in discussion in this epistle. Unclean meats uh, and unclean meats are not subject at all. And, uh, you know, it's not the subject under discussion and it is not even mentioned. No unclean meat is mentioned at all. As other parts of God's words show, unclean meats should never be consumed, they should never be eaten. Parts of God's law that show that is Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 5 is yet another difficult scripture to understand. And it says, But every woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, for that is even all one as all one as if she were shaven. Now this verse is used by some to substantiate the idea that every woman who is a follower of Christ should wear a veil or hat, you know, when she prays. Well, the scripture is not talking about hats or veils. The subject in question is hair. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 5, it says, But if a woman has long hair, it is glory to her, for her hair is given for a covering. So notice, Paul, under inspiration, speaks of long hair as the covering or veil, not some hat or piece of cloth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 6, Paul discusses various lengths of hair. Four lengths are mentioned. Not covered, shorn, shaven, and covered. Now, shaven designates a total, totally bald head. Shorn hair is very short cropped hair, as when a sheep is shorn. Hair, hair that was a covering is short hair. Hair that is a covering is long hair. It should be stylish, attractive and feminine, not a masculine cut. This, of course, refers to the length, not the style, so that long hair can be worn up on top of the head or in a French roll or bun, even though it might appear shorter. Now, in the setting of verse 5 by itself, a veil just does not fit. What does a veil ha have to do with uh, being shaven? You see, rather, Paul is saying that if a woman is going to have short cropped hair, she might as well go all the way and shave herself bald. Now, to further show that this chapter is dealing with hair lengths, not veils, let us consider 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 4, and uh, the same chapter in verse 14. If you take a look at verse 4, verse 4 says that if a man has his head covered with, when he prays, he is dishonoring his head, who is Jesus Christ. Verse 14 shows that it is a shame for a man to have long hair. Then, in 1 Corinthians 11, in verse 10, verse 10 shows the purpose of long hair on a woman. Now, this verse should be rendered as it is in the margin. For the cause out the wo woman to have a covering in sign that she is under the power of her husband. You see, long hair is a sign that a woman is willing to be in subjection to a man and that she acknowledges the need for protecting by a protection by angels. First Corinthians eleven, we already mentioned the section of chapter six through sixteen. So it's time to finally explain 
this passage. Because some wonder whether or not a woman should wear a covering on her head in church. Well, the Church of God teaches that a woman does not need to wear a hat, a veil, or any other type of head covering in order to attend its church services. Now, these are different points of view expressed in com- commentaries on whether uh, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 5 through 15, was referring to a woman's long hair or to a veil or other head covering associated with temporary standards of honor. Well, in either case, it is agreed in the Church of God that the Scripture does not enjoin the wearing of hats or veils today. The Church of God does recognize, however, that the dress styles and matters of honor are not the same as uh, are not the same in every country or society around the world. So, whenever a follower of Christ is a guest in, of a community in which these standards differ from those of his or her own society, well, care should be taken that uh, care should be taken not to give any unnecessary offense in the matters of style of dress and deportment. Then in chapter 11, verse 26, here is another difficult scriptures, and it's very often a very quickly forgotten or overlooked or not understood by many, many Christians, many nominal Christians. Because First Corinthians 11, 26 says, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Now many have misinterpreted this verse as if to say that you may partake of the Lord's Supper as often as you please. Now that's not the case because this verse says, First Corinthians eleven twenty six, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup. It does not say, take it as often as you please. And it says, as often as we observe Lord's Supper, we proclaim Lord's death till he comes. And Jesus commanded in First Corinthians 11 verse 26, these do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, how often should that be? You see, Christ is our Passover, sacrificed for us. He was sacrificed on the exact day of the year that the Passover lambs always had been slain. Now, as the Old Testament Passover commemorated Israel's deliverance from Egypt, a symbol of sin, so the Passover of the New Testament indeed commemorates the Jesus Christ's death and our deliverance from sin. And therefore, in remark, you know, in remembrance of the Lord's death, the Passover of Lord's Supper is to be taken annually on the anniversary of the great event it commemorates. Jesus instituted this New Testament ordinance on the eve of his death. It was 14th day of the first month of Abib of the Hebrew calendar. Now following Jesus' instruction, the followers of Christ are to observe the Passover of the New Testament on Abib 14th. You see, his church was to continue to observe the 14th of Abib, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 26. The symbols of the Passover of the New Testament, commonly called the Lord's Supper, were unleavened bread, represented Christ's body, which was broken for use, and wine, uh, for use, I mean, it was broken for us, of course, and that's the use of the uh, of the of that bread. It was the broken body of Christ that would take away the penalty that we have incurred with our for our sins and with our sins, and therefore then liberty, liberty to you know serve God and liberty to uh, 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 to to do it in, properly in the proper time. So the symbols, you know, they were unleavened bread representing Christ's body, which was broken for us, and wine representing Christ's blood. Now Jesus' body is represented by the bread. He says in Matthew 26, verse 28, I am the bread of life. The same he says in John chapter 6, verse 48. I am the bread of life. His blood is symbolized by the wine. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Well, Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 10, 16, he explains the following. The cup of blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? 
Now, how important is it to partake of the New Testament Passover? Well, extremely important because it is a question of life and death according to Christ. Because he proclaimed in no uncertain terms in John chapter 6, verse 53 through 56, in no uncertain terms we have the words of our eternal. They say, uh, most assuredly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. That's the passage in John 6, verse 53 through 56. Then uh, we have another difficult scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34, which says, Let your women keep silence consists in the churches. For it is not, it is not permitted unto them to speak. Uh, but they are commanded uh, not to speak, but they are commanded, sorry, uh, 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 they are not permitted, okay, to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. So now from, so from this, what we have just read, some wonder about the practice of ordaining women to the ministry. Well, the Church of God follows the example in the New Testament concerning of deaconesses, in Romans 16, verse 1, the word servant in the original Greek is diakonos. Diakonos is translated as deacon or deaconess. It means attendant or servant. And both deacons and deaconesses, they serve the church by assisting in non-preaching functions. That instruction is found in Acts chapter 6, verse 2 and verse 3. Now, based on the practice of the New Testament church and the teachings of the Apostle Paul, the Church of God does not ordain women as ministers. Paul says against it in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 34, and in 1 Timothy chapter 12, sorry, chapter 2, verse 12. Now, the important role of women in the Church is amply and amply demonstrated throughout the Scripture. The Bible also includes instructive examples from the lives of outstanding women. Well, consider Deborah's leadership, consider Hannah's prayer, consider Miriam's song, consider the teaching of Lemuel's mother, the accounts of Ruth and Esther in the Old Testament, and of Mary, Priscilla, Dorcas, and Phoebe in the New Testament. In today's church, Women contribute in such areas as directing choirs, instructing youth programs, uh, various management roles, and writing for church publications. And that's already a handful of work for women anyway, as well as men. And the work of men even goes beyond that. First Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 29. It says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the dead? A very good question. Well, you see, many wonder about the practice of being baptized for those who have died unbaptized. That so-called baptism of the dead. Or baptism, rather, for the dead. So, the inspired New Testament church did not follow this practice, and the Apostle Paul did not teach it. This custom was introduced in, into the professing Christian world about 150 AD. Uh, the man who introduced it was Marcion, Marcion. It was a man who created his own religion and established his own church in Rome in 144 Anno Domini AD. The Bible also clearly shows that before a person may be baptized, he or she must first repent. We read about that in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. And not only that, not only repent, but also believe, as it says in Mark 16, 16, Acts 16, 31, and 33. The dead are not able to repent and believe, or, or believe, because the dead know not anything. Ecclesiastes 9, verse 5. 
And so baptism is for the living. Baptism is a symbol whereby the living acknowledge their sins, they figuratively die with Christ in a watery grave, and rise out of that watery grave to live in a new righteous life uh, through Jesus Christ and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. In Galatians 2.20 we have that well portrayed, and also in Romans chapter 6, in uh, verse 4 and verse 8 and verse 9. The baptism is also a symbol of the resurrection because to rise up out of the watery grave is to acknowledge belief in the resurrection of the dead and to surrender one's life to China, to Christ now, to crucify the self now, to be baptized. All this is foolish unless there is a resurrection of the dead. So, uh, if there was there were no hope of the resurrection, life would be summed up this way. First Corinthians fifteen thirty two. Let us eat a drink, for tomorrow we die. Now Corinthians first Corinthians fifteen verse twenty nine becomes clear. The subject of the entire fifteenth chapter is the resurrection. Paul cites example of those who were baptized as one proof of the resurrection. Their action symbolized their hope that they would live again. The resurrection is, uh, you see, the hope of the dead. Or, as it says in Jeremiah, the hope of Israel. <laughs> so, uh, the resurrection is the hope of the dead. And there is one quote which says, Why were they baptized for, for the dead, if the dead rise not? Okay, so uh, let's see uh, the uh, now King James Version. King James Version. And uh, let's see what it says. King James Version says, Why were they baptized for the dead if the dead rise not? So, uh, again, the subject of the entire 15th chapter is is the resurrection and uh, there is you know there is no other way that we can uh, mess it up or, or 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 just you know or just interpret it any other way so it was markian in AD 150 who created his own religion and established his own church in rome in AD 100 144 and the Bible clearly shows that before a person may be baptized, he or she must first repent. We have that in Acts chapter 2 verse 38. And not only repent, but also believe. In Mark 16, 16, Acts 16, 31 and 33, that's what it says. The dead are not able to repent or believe because the dead know not anything. It says in Ecclesiastes 9, 5. So baptism is for the living. It's a symbol whereby the living acknowledge their sins, figuratively die again with Christ in a watery grave, and rise out of that watery grave to live in a new righteous life through Jesus Christ and the dwelling of the Holy Spirit. We have scriptures that refer to that process in Galatians 2.20, in Romans 6.4, and in Romans 8, uh, verse 9. So again, baptism is also a symbol of the resurrection, to rise up out of the watery grave is to acknowledge belief in the resurrection of the dead, which is mentioned in Romans chapter 6, and to surrender one's life to Christ now, to crucify the self now, to be baptized. All of this, all this is foolish unless there is a resurrection of the dead. Because if there were no hope of the resurrection, life could be summed up this way, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. We can compare that with First Corinthians 15 verse 32. So now again, uh, in 1 Corinthians 15.29, now that we have understood this, now it becomes clear. The subject of the entire 15th chapter, again, is the resurrection. And Paul cites the example of those who were baptized as one proof of the resurrection. Their actions symbolize their hope that they would live again. The resurrection is the hope of the dead. And as I said, the hope of Israel. So, uh, the question in the King James Version, this seems to be Paul's question. Why were they baptized for the dead if dead rise not? 
But you see, this verse is not correctly translated from the original inspired Greek. Because Paul is not talking about being baptized in the place of the dead, or on behalf of the dead, or for the dead. The Greek word translated for is hooper. And this word has several meanings and can be translated above, over, instead of, for the realization of, or for the hope of, depending upon the context in which it is used. So notice the following example. Paul declared in Philippians chapter 2 verse 13, For it is God which works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Now the Greek word translated of in this verse is hooper, the same word as used in 1 Corinthians 15.29. And in Philippians 2.13, hooper cannot mean instead of. No, it cannot mean instead of. It would be senseless to say, for it is God which works in you both to will and to do instead of his good pleasure. Correctly translated, this verse says, God works in you both to will and to do for the realization of his good pleasure. Now, this is translation given in the analytical Greek lexicon. What is God's pleasure? Well, it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, declares Jesus in Luke 12, verse 32. So God works in us in the hope of giving us his kingdom. And thus the Greek word hooper in 1 Corinthians 15.29, according to the context, should be translated for the hope of. Now notice the verse again. Else, what shall they do which are baptized for the hope of the dead, if the dead rise not at all? Why are they then baptized for the hope of the dead? And what is the hope of the dead? Well, it is the resurrection. Paul is writing about baptism. Baptism illustrates the hope of the resurrection. Baptism arising out of a watery grave, is a symbol of the hope of the dead, which is the hope of the resurrection. This verse, then, has nothing to do with the false doctrine of baptism on behalf of the unbaptized dead, which is basically practiced by one denomination, by the Mormons. So we've just exhausted now the most difficult scriptures to understand in First Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, let's move on to the Second Corinthians. And we have... In uh, that epistle, the first uh, difficult scripture would be in chapter 6, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. For he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Well, now you see why it is... Uh, why this scripture is difficult because millions believe that this time today today right now is the only day of salvation however the original greek text did not contain the word the neither did the original greek hebrew text that is in isaiah 49 verse 8 from which paul quoted it also did not uh, contain the word the and this verse should be translated as is in Isaiah chapter 49 verse 8 in the King James Version. Here is Isaiah 49 8, King James Version. Thus says the Lord, In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee. You know, for he says, I've heard thee in a time, in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation which uh, have I succored thee, behold, now is accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So this was King James Version, Second Corinthians chapter six, verse two. And now combining Isaiah forty nine eight and Second Corinthians with Second Corinthians two, a better rendition of Second Corinthians six two would be, I have heard thee in a day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, how is an acceptable, now is an acceptable time. Behold, now is a day of salvation. So if the word the was left out, would it refer only to the time Paul wrote it? Since Paul quoted from Isaiah, would Isaiah's time be the only day of salvation? Obviously not. Or no one before or after those times could obtain salvation. For all of those that have been called by God and received the gift of His Holy Spirit, the time in which they lived was their only day of salvation, their only chance. 
for those of us today that have repented and have been baptized and received God's Holy Spirit, this is our day of salvation. And there is a time table from when people will receive salvation, you know. Jesus Christ was first. It says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20 and 23. After Christ are those that are His at His coming, as is mentioned in 1 Peter 4, 17 and 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Now what about all the others that have not been called? Because after Adam and Eve chose the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God allowed a period for men to experiment and try His ways to find peace and happiness. And He then cuts off access to the tree of life, His Holy Spirit, for all men except the few He has called in this age. Now, without God's Holy Spirit, ancient Israel was blinded spiritually. Deuteronomy 29 testifies about that, verses 2 through 4. In a, and Isaiah uh, chapter 5, uh, 25 and verse 7. So, uh, without God's Holy Spirit, ancient Israel was blinded spiritually and allowed to suffer the penalties of the wrong way, so they might know that He is God as written in Ezekiel 20, verse 26. Ezekiel also gave the Gentiles... Oh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, Ezekiel, I'm speaking <laughs> speaking about the Paul. <laughs> but uh, he also gave the Gentiles over to a reprobate mind because they did not like to retain him in their knowledge, writes Paul in, first, in Romans chapter 1, verse 28 and 29. As you see, God has concluded them all, so all humankind, in unbelief. And why? Well, that he might have mercy on all, says Romans 11, verse 32. He has allowed Satan, the god of this world, to deceive mankind. To deceive mankind, when men, women, and children. And that's why, as it says in Revelation 12, 9, the whole world is deceived by Satan. Also in Revelation 20, verse 10, and in Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, and chapter 11, verse 3, we find that the God of this world is Satan, and he has, been allowed, he has been allowed to rule until the return of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, of course, spoke in parables to those, so those who had been called by the Father could understand, but the truth would be hidden from those not called. We have the example of those parables, like in Matthew 13, verse 10 through 15, in Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12, in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verse 10, in John, chapter 12, verse 40, in Acts, chapter 28, verse 20, 26 and 27, 27, and finally in Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 9. Now those who live into the millennial rule of Jesus Christ here on this earth will then be given their chance of sal at salvation. The people that walked in darkness, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2 through 7, so the people, he says, among other things, the people that, that uh, walked in darkness, that is in blindness, have seen a great light, so spiritual blindness was removed. And Christ's government and peace will increase on the earth. Isaiah chapter 9 verse 2 through 7. And Christ will pour out his spirit on all flesh. Acts chapter 2 verse 17. And the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the eternal. Says Isaiah in chapter 11 verse 9. It will be full of the knowledge of God as the water covers the sea. Can you imagine that? Now the vast majority, the rest of the dead will not live until, again, until 1,000 years are finished. We read that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 5, and verses 11 and 12. Now, this, would, this will include even the residents of Sodom, who are mentioned in Matthew 10, verse 15, and uh, chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, and in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verse 12, you see Ezekiel 37, uh, verses 1 through 14 gives a good picture of how this resurrection will be accomplished for all people. They will live in the physical life, in the physical life, of course, in the physical flesh, or for, uh, for a period of time sufficient to be given an opportunity to receive salvation. And then it will be according to their choice, of course. Nobody can force somebody else to make the right choice. Second Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 14 is another difficult scripture. It says, Be you not equally yoked together with unbeliever. 
to what fellowship, for what fellowship has righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion has light with darkness. Well, you see, some have used this scripture to prove that followers of Christ should not become more involved in the communities as light to the world or to serve others outside the church. Well, there is no way that Second Corinthians chapter 6 verse 14 can apply to serving and interacting in a positive way with people who are not of our fellowship. If this were the case, then Jesus Christ himself would have violated the verse in question. Now Jesus ate with sinners, he spent time with them, reached out to them, he healed them and preached his message of the coming kingdom of God to them. In becoming more like Christ and exhibiting Christ like love, we should follow his example in being lights to the world. And therefore Second Corinthians 6.14 is clearly not a prohibition of associating with unbelievers. Rather it is a command not to be in mental agreement and harmony with people who are not like-minded with us in the faith of Jesus Christ. Now let us also notice the analogy of yoked together. This involves involves far more than serving people in our communities. Oxen yoked together move to forward with the same purpose. Paul warns the followers of Christ in, in Corinth not to be in any mental concordance that leads away from God's way. Now obviously we can do good works of serving the community without our minds being in harmony with ungodly principles. We read about that in Romans chapter 8, verse 4 through 9. And uh, that was the, those were the difficult scriptures that I could find in the first and second Corinthians. Hopefully, now you have much better grasp of what the New Testament actually is revealing as the Word of God.